Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now many of us will have visited aquariums and marvelled at the marine life on display. But what role can aquariums have in supporting conservation efforts? Here to discuss this and other topics is today's guest Elizabeth Stevenson. Now Elizabeth is the Programme Director of the New England Aquarium's Marine Conservation Action Fund, which is a grants programme that provides support for community-based and locally managed marine conservation projects in low and middle income countries across the globe. To date, the Marine Conservation Action Fund, or MCAF as it's often termed, has supported over 200 projects in more than 60 countries across six continents. In the podcast, we talk about the work of the New England Aquarium in support of conservation efforts and also explore what the Marine Conservation Action Fund is, how it works and how you could potentially benefit from it also. Elizabeth then shares what it's like to manage a programme such as this, along with her career journey and advice of people like you who might be interested to follow in her footsteps. It's a marine granting, locally managed and community based pod chat. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. I am Elizabeth Stevenson, and I am the director of the Marine Conservation Action Fund at the New England Aquarium. Great. Well, welcome, Elizabeth. It's lovely having you on the podcast. Uh, Nice to have this time together talking about your work, the aquarium, the Marine Conservation Action Fund, your career and advice too. We've got lots of kind of topics to kind of discuss over the next sort of 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, Let's start with the New England Aquarium. Um, yes. I know you're remote based right now, but I know you're quite yes. familiar with the aquarium too. Um, and it, it's obviously an important part of, of who you are and what you do. Um, mm-hmm. Take us on like a virtual tour of what it is. You know, where is it? What would people see or find if they were to go yeah. there? Oh, well, yes, the aquarium is a, is a fantastic place. And I've been working there for, for 15 years, although remotely, as you said, but um, it's home to exhibits of you know a wide range of of species um from we have fur seals and harbor seals to um sea dragons and penguins we're very much known for our penguin exhibit because you come in and and you see the penguins right off and they they make all sorts of noise and um are just great fun to watch and then we have this uh wonderful giant ocean tank um which is just covers the whole um top to bottom of the aquarium that that as you travel up around the ramp you just see different different species as you go because they are you know they are at different depths um and it's it's a wonderful experience and um i remember taking my kids there and just putting them in front of one of the windows of the giant ocean tank and and they're they're mesmerized so um so i i hope you'll all come visit us because it's it's an incredible place to be um it's on the boston waterfront on the east coast of the us um and The thing that people don't realize about the aquarium is the incredible work we do that goes far beyond the walls, whether it's through um, working with the city of Boston on on an accessible waterfront to um, to some of our breeding programs, to our uh, longstanding North Atlantic right whale research program, um, fisheries programs. We have we have um, a huge amount of of uh, research and conservation programs through our Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. So uh, it's a it's an, a place with incredible breadth and depth in what we do for um, ocean education as well as conservation and research. Yeah, sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah. thank you. And actually that leads in perfectly to what I'd like to discuss as well, really, which is like the role of aquariums like New England Aquarium in supporting conservation efforts, which is what your work's all about. And we're going to talk specifically about the Marine Conservation Action Fund um, in a minute. But before we do, and you're already touching on it a little bit there really nicely, like, you know, what role do aquariums have, you know, in conservation efforts? How can aquariums help? Yes, yeah, so, well, there there are so many different uh, ways that aquariums have a role in conservation efforts. And so one is through um, public education. So we have an, an incredible conservation learning team that works, um, you know, as we say, on the floor of the aquarium with visitors, as well as with um, communities um, to educate it about the issues facing the ocean, how they can be involved and to learn from them about what they're seeing in their communities. Um, and then so there's that piece of it. And, and it's also known that um, research has shown that zoos and aquariums are one of the most trusted institutions 
um, for getting information. So we do have a really important role to play in, um, in informing the public about ocean conservation issues. And so we also, we also play an advocacy role at the New England Aquarium. So we take the research that is done by our scientists um, and we help uh, use that to inform advocacy and, and have testified on the um, floor of Congress um, about important bills affecting imperiled species. So that's another area. And then of course there are, are breeding programs and that, that we have in terms of the conservation of, of endangered species. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's many, many different ways we play a role. And then of course, which I'll talk about more is the, the program that I'm so fortunate to, to lead, uh, the Marine Conservation Action Fund. But but yes, the, the New England Aquarium and, um, is definitely a leader in terms of it's, the, like I said, the breadth and depth with which it, it supports ocean conservation and research yeah, and education. And with the research specifically, you talked there about scientists um, mm -hmm. at New England Aquarium. You have scientists and researchers as part of the yes. staff, do you? And what, what do they do? Are they just studying within the aquarium? Do they go outside, you know, into, into you know, the marine environment more broadly? What, what role do they have? They, they, yes, we have a, we have a, you know, 30 plus um, staff of um, scientists that do, so, so there are a lot of scientists on staff that, as you said, do research at the aquarium on, you know, with, with the animals in, in our care, we have um, a, an incredible rescue and rehabilitation facility that rescues hundreds of cold stranded sea turtles every year. Um, and that is, that is off site at a different location, but, um, but yeah, so that's an, that's another piece of it where we have veterinarians and scientists. Um, and then we have the Anderson Cabot center for ocean life, where we have scientists working on, um, issues from, you know, the impacts of, of wind, um, doing aerial surveys of species. Uh, we have, uh, scientists working on, um, you know, fisheries technology, as well as the right whale program. We have scientists working on um, studying hormones in marine species to assess for stress mm -hmm. uh, and using things like baleen and, and whale poop. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible place in terms of the um, vastness of the programs. We also have a, um, a collaboration on a you know, blue tech incubator. So we have people working on the blue economy so it's a yeah it's there's there's a lot happening um there's a there's a lot to a lot to learn about and a lot of you know great information and learning exchange to be had there yeah so very much out in the gulf to answer your question to circle back and answer your question yes so we're very much out in the gulf of maine and some of our scientists also have off, you know locations beyond that um sea turtle scientists has worked in puerto rico as well as in panama so um, we had collaboration with local local scientists there. So um, so yeah, our our reach is pretty is pretty broad. Yeah, and what's really impressive, I think, about an aquarium like yours is mostly kind of marine conservation is is largely funded through kind of charitable work and donations and and yes. grants. And we're going to circle around to that very yes. soon. Um, yes. But actually, you are a business. Ultimately, you know, you have the quite unique privileged position of having an income from the people that come to visit the aquarium that can generate the funds for conservation. There's not many kind of businesses that do that in the world. Right. Yes. No, we are a nonprofit institution. And wow. so um, we, we do, we do depend on, as we say, the gate of people coming in. And, and I think that's an exciting thing for people to know that when they're coming to our aquarium, the, the, you know, the vast uh, research and conservation efforts that it's supporting, as well as the rescue and rehabilitation of, of sea turtles every year. Um, and so, but we do rely on, we do rely on donations. We do rely on individual donors um, and foundations and government and um, mm -hmm. corporations. So, um, so yes, it's, and we're, we're grateful to, grateful to all our supporters who, who make these programs possible. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So you're the program director of this thing yeah. called the Marine Conservation Action Fund. And I've been yes. a little bit of reading around it just before the podcast, too. But um, yeah. explain to us, what is the Marine Conservation Action Fund? Like, you know, yeah, how does it how does it help the world that we're in? 
Yes. Um, so the Marine Conservation Action Fund, or I call it MCAF for short, because that's quite a mouthful. Um, the Marine Conservation Action Fund is a uh, is a small grants and fellowship program that supports ocean conservation leaders working in low and middle income countries across the globe. And so we provide different types of support, uh, financial support through grants up to twelve to fifteen thousand um, dollars. But we also provide professional support. We build a, a signature of the program is we build enduring relationships, two way learning relationships with the project leaders and fellows that we're fortunate to to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and so we um, a big piece of that is our fellows program through which we have um, selected conservation leaders who we essentially commit to supporting in a variety of ways through the life of their career. And we build a community of them. Um, and in fact, they're all coming together in Boston um, in late September for our second ever summit. So so it's 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 heavily centered on relationship building, on listening, on us understanding what their needs are and being responsive, as well as our granting program, which the granting program has been around since 1999. And the fellows program is is um, from 2015. So that's been a more recent development. But Right. And the fellows come from the grantees. Is that right? So you have grantees that come through and from those are selected fellows. So originally, yes, that was originally how it worked. But then this last time when we um, onboarded new fellows in 2022, um, we did an open call. And then we had a multi-stage um, multi application process. So anybody could apply. And but it but they were given um, awarded a grant as part of their fellowship. So that was exciting to get, you know, just new. Um, I think out of the out of the five new fellows, only one was a previous uh, project. We call them project leaders now. But yes, I just um, one was a previous project leader. I got you. Yeah. Um, can you like give us some examples of some of the projects that you've been supporting yes. then and some of the the outcomes or impacts that you've seen as a result of them? Yes, yes. So we have a big focus on projects that, well, it's a priority for us to have the projects be community based so that the, the project leaders or fellows are working closely with their communities and local stakeholders to, to make change happen. Um, because that's the way, as you know, uh, to do lasting conservation. Um, and so one project that I'd love to highlight is uh, Mission Tiburon, which means um, Mission Shark, and that's in Costa Rica. And um, Andres Lopez and Elena Zanella are the co-founders. And they, um, you know, they really started out by um, observing that there were um, baby sharks. Uh, everybody loves baby sharks. Baby hammerhead sharks in particular oh. could not be cuter. Yeah. Um, so baby hammerhead sharks on the West Coast in this estuary called Gulf of Duce. And so they set out to, to determine if that was a nursery ground. And over years and years, um, they did make the case with their data through tagging. And that's that's we've been fortunate to help support that work among other funders and supporters and collaborators. Um, and but they didn't they didn't solely do the science and say, like, hey, there's this you know nursery ground. They worked with local communities, but they um, worked with the government. They became advisors to the government. They um, went into local schools. They do school programs uh, year after year after year, and and kids are now really invested in hammerhead sharks as a flagship species that's in their backyard. Um, and so they've they've done this really holistic um, approach or a systems approach to mm -hmm. conservation, and not just in terms of the people that they're connecting with, but also the ecosystem. So now they're working on you know mangroves are really important nursery habitat for. Um, you know, the, the fish that the shark rely on, sharks rely on, and, and for fisheries, and so, and for, as a blue carbon um, mm -hmm. source, so they are working on mangrove restoration and preservation, and so this whole ecosystem, they're, they're protecting all the pieces of it, and also working with the whole ecosystem of people. Mm -hmm. They have, a, you know, an effort to um, support women through alternative livelihoods. And so it's it's a really comprehensive program. It's um and it's one that's a, a model for us that we see. Um, and so those are those that's one of the types of programs. And they're through their work, and this was one of their goals that they achieved was to establish Costa Rica's first shark sanctuary in 2018. And so we really had an incredible outcome. And but um, you know, that's when the work really begins is 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 to continue um, moving forward from that great conservation victory, continue the community engagement. So 
so yeah so that's an example i could give many more but that <laughs> an amazing example though isn't it how like uh, yes. you know, understanding that this could be a nursery for sharks and science and research expanding out yes. to working with the local communities bringing it on as a protected area yes what yes. role does the aquarium provide in supporting the grantees you know perhaps in that example or others like you know what yes beyond just giving money i'm, I'm assuming right. it's a lot more than that isn't it yes yes so we we you know big big piece of what we offer is is funding and that's so critical and i think so i'll talk about that for a minute just before the other things because um it's really hard to be a entrepreneurial conservationist and you're constantly having to search for money. Um, so we do try to make our practices as accessible as possible um, in terms of, you know, and providing ongoing support, which is also a real gap in the funding world. A lot of funding goes to new and novel ideas rather than like the the ongoing conservation work that's necessary. So so even though funding is is a big piece, it's it's how we do it. I think that's mm. that's important. Mm. Um, and um, we also the funding is the the proposals are reviewed mostly by people um, you know who we've who who we funded before. So there are all there are project leaders who are doing similar type of work. So there's a participatory aspect to it. Yes. Um, so, but yes, in addition to that, we provide professional support. We've offered things, things we've done is like, we've offered, um, to support courses like the ones that, that the great courses that you offer conservation careers, as well as wild team, um, for fellows to take or for their, um, colleagues to take. Um, we also, a, a big piece of what we do is, you know, is around community building, um, bringing them together for summits every few years, um, connecting them with one another, um, the aquarium has a, a really significant public platform, so it's promoting their work through our channels. Um, and we have initially with the fellows program before the pandemic, fellows would come to the aquarium for 10 days. They would speak to all our a variety of audiences, give a public lecture, um, and they would meet with our scientists and staff and share their work. And, you know, there would be the two way learning that that happens. So um, so it's it's really an encompassing encompassing program and we we look for any opportunities we can to, to provide support whether it's introducing to other funders providing letters of support mm -hmm. um offering trainings just trying to it's constant listening and attentiveness to figure out what we can do for each in each person and organization that that will be most helpful um along with just a lot of um, recognition and appreciation for the work they're doing because mm. it's it's incredibly difficult and can be really lonely. Um, so that's that's a big piece of it. Yeah, and what sounds really nice about what the work you do is um, it's not sort of parachute conservation. You don't jump in, fix a yes. problem, jump out. Yes, uh, yes. That's a lesson you've mentioned it yourself, like you know, yes. that long term sustainable support is so important to. To, to success, but particularly for early stage projects that are just finding their yes. feet and getting off the ground and and really need that, you know, to break out from the boom and bust of quick grant gone, you know, and it's sort of everything exactly. kind of falls, you know, falls by the wayside, you know, once that support ends, but you're there for the long term, which is so important. Uh, and what also seems important is just um, encouraging kind of local support, working with local communities, mm -hmm. increasing access to conservation. And we talked just before we hit record about, diversity yeah. and equity and inclusion as well within conservation is that something that, that is important for for the grant program yes very very important and it's been a real um learning journey for us and um you know we've made some shifts in our programming over the years so mcaf when it was first founded we funded projects on you know any any country with a coastline including high income countries mm -hmm. uh, across the globe and then around 2010 we shifted to exclusively focusing on lower middle income countries because they are the majority countries of the world and they um, make up the majority of the world's coastline have the majority of the you know biodiversity hotspots and there are um you know there there are fewer they also face some of the the problems that that we all have created in our high income nations um from climate change and overfishing and and all of that. And there are fewer financial resources available to support local conservation action, but there's no shortage of human resources. There's no shortage of talent. So 
One of the fellows that's been really influential on us is Dr. Asha DeVos, from, uh, who's the founder of Ocean Swell in Sri Lanka. She's a blue whale scientist, mm-hmm. incredible, incredible human being. Um, and so she, she has said, you know, talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. Yeah. And so that's, yeah, I know she's got a lot of great quotes. So um, the other one that we, we go by is, you know, to, to save the ocean, every coastline needs a local hero. And so that's what we, um, so it, more recently we shifted to um, in the past couple of years to, for new projects, um, the, the project leader needs to be from in based in the country where the work is taking place, because that is not, only important in terms of equity and battling parachute conservation, um, you know, which we've seen uh, where people, you know, they run out of funding and they leave or political situation is challenging and they, and they depart a project, you know, if they're coming in as a foreigner. And, and so the having somebody there to steward it over the long term who knows the language, who knows the culture, who knows the, the situation is, is really important, but also somebody who respects that, you know, they they're not going to be part of every community that they're going to you know work with so they they need to to make those you know two-way relationships with um with those communities not just not just parachute into a community either and and so we we really try to make sure that um that that people are are thinking about that in in their work as well um even if they are from that country it's also about the the communities they're they're working with so um and we, you know, we really, um, we even think about it in terms of our, our language, like the, a paper just came out that, that was from a leading team of experts, including Dr. DeVos on, um, you know, the, on the tropical majority of uh, informing ocean conservation. And, um, and one of the things was talking about capacity sharing as opposed to capacity building or capacity development, mm-hmm. because it, it, it honors the fact that there's so much capacity already there that is, mm-hmm. that is present. It's not like we're coming in and saying like, oh, you need to learn this. It's, it's um, recognizing all the capacity that's, that exists and, and the, the many diverse ways that that can exist. So. Yeah, and I guess sharing their knowledge back with you, then teaching exactly. you, teaching each other, the network, the fellowship, the alumni. Yeah, it, I, I exactly. love that phrase. I, I you know, um, talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. I've never heard yeah. it put so simply before. It's really yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yes, she's she's. I I encourage anybody to, um, you know, look look up Dr. DeVos and her work, and she's got incredible TED talks and. You know, she's an amazing scientist, but has been um, a pioneer, uh, a really powerful voice for for um, anti anti colonial science, and um, has a great op ed called "The Problem of Colonial Science," along with a number of papers. So um, that that has just informed you know that and the other um, you know the fellows and project leaders we work with, and just hearing their stories, whether it's about colonial science or, or otherwise, um, has has been the source of our growth and adaptation and evolution of, you know, of our program. So um, we are very much uh, listened, uh, listening to the community we serve and and they have, have taught us what to do in, in, in this field. So. Yeah. And referencing that growth and adaptation of the program, you're 20 years old as a program, yes, give or take, yes, right? Yes. Um, yes. You've had, I think something like 200 grantees in 60 yeah. countries. I was looking at your website. Mm-hmm. Um, what does the future look like? You know, if you could project forwards 20 years from now, could you predict the direction that the, the fund might take? Yes, yes. Well, um, we'd love to grow our, well, we'd love to grow our own resources too, because we are, you know, we are limited in our own budget in terms of of the, the things that we can do. So we'd love to grow our own resources and, and um, sustainability so that we can continue offering the this type of support to conservation leaders. Um, and, uh, we, we'd love to be able to, um, we'd love to be able to offer multi-year grants. Like that is such a, we do offer ongoing funding, but, um, really to be able to give people like, here's three years and you're set for these next three years. And and we don't yet have the resources for that, but that's a huge goal because it's just a much more humane way to give money, you know, and, and for people to be able to count on it. Um, and so, um, we'd like to have, you know, more fellows in our community sharing with one another, more opportunities to bring them together, um, supporting them to do workshops in their own 
in their own regions, you know, bringing together regional groups. We have, we have some fellows that are already doing that type of work and it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, Another piece of our program, we've just started offering um, grants for fellow, we call them fellow led fellowships. So fellows who are running their own fellowship programs, Mm -hmm. we'd love to see more of that happening because, you know, um, it's important, it's important to train the next generation, you know, and, and to know that for this work to carry on, you know, to scale over time, um, you need to have that. So that's the vision for the future would be that, you know, as, as some of the fellows were supporting, you know, Mm -hmm. travel towards the, the later years of their career, that there's this huge multiplier effect that we've, you know, we've been able to help contribute to their success in achieving, um, where there are many more conservationists um, out, you know, uh, doing this type of work and and that we can support them now, you know, mm-hmm. that we can support their work. Um, so that, and that the organizations are strong. Like we've also just started offering organizational grants for core operations and organizational development so that they have strong organizations that last, mm-hmm. that become these, you know, become these hubs in their region collaborating with other hubs um, and and building out this, you know, having so that there is a local hero on every coastline. Um, so that's that's a big that's a big piece of what we what we want to see happen in the future. And, you know, again, to for for funding to be more and not not just our own, but but widely in philanthropy to have it be more directed you know, directly to uh, local conservation leaders. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Exciting times ahead then. Lots mm-hmm. of plans. We'll, yes, we'll yes. see what happens. Yeah. Um, I'd like to kind of switch gears slightly, if I if I may then, and talk yes. about you then, Elizabeth, and your yes. job and your career um to date and, and sort of reflect on that slightly. And so you're the program director yes. of MCAF, as you say, Marine Conservation Action Fund. Um what's a program director? Like what 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 what's your job? What's your role? Yes. How would you describe it to someone that has no idea what it is? And could you maybe yes. paint a typical day or a week or you know, just just honestly, like, you know, transparently, like what what's your job like? Yes. Well, yes, it's and it's and it's um it's been a bit of a you know a journey too, in the sense that I started out as a I was hired as a court, the MCAF coordinator and then the manager and then the program officer and now the director. So wow, <laughs> you've worked up the ranks. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and you know, but it's it's been me though. I I I ha- um, I've been able to sort of run the program in those different um, roles in, 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 throughout my time at the aquarium. Um, so my yeah. So as the director, uh, a big piece of what I do is provide strategic direction for the program and um, in terms of the the vision, which I said, you know, as I said, like is so much of it comes from, from listening and learning. So a big piece of what I do is, is taking the, the um, learnings that we, we have from other, from other funders, from the the fellows and project leaders in our community, from communities of practice. And it's like a patchwork quilt of ideas from my fellow staff members um, and putting those together into what, you know, what the program's direction is. So it's the big picture. Mm. Um, And, you know, I, 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 I'm fortunate to have a, a great team. My my colleagues uh, Melinda and Emily, who work closely with me on on all of this and contribute ideas, and so it's all about synthesizing those together. And then another big piece of is um, you know fundraising is definitely serving as working with our um, development team at the aquarium to to fundraise for the program is a big piece of a big piece of my role, as well as representing the program and the aquarium, you know, publicly. Um, working with my colleagues to integrate our work. So the pieces like that uh, are are what really define define my role. Um, but it's incredibly diverse because you know there's there's marketing aspects. We have a wonderful marketing team, so we work with them. We work, you know, so um, but again, I'm fortunate because of the team I have that I can focus on those bigger picture things now, whereas um, you know, earlier in my career it was it was like wearing seven different hats. <laughs> <laughs> so um but yes yeah, so a lot of what i do uh there's a lot of um emails and zoom meetings <laughs> that's for sure that's, that's the I reality think that's, i think that's it that's why my kids are like wow it's just like all the emails and but um <laughs> yeah really a lot of communication with uh you know the community we serve with with funders with colleagues um and and you know 
again, a lot of a lot of meetings and things like that, and and um, some writing as well. You know, we're working on a paper uh, about the um, cumulative impacts of the projects we've supported over the years. So, um, so those those types of things are. But majority of my day is emails and Zoom meetings. <laughs> which this is part of <laughs> exactly which is great this is a, this is nice yes it's and it's it's wonderful when I do you know I am remote so when I do get to go to Boston and spend time with my colleagues I that's you know extra special because uh you know we're all separated in our homes now so many of us so it's it's really nice to get there and be be part of be part of the you know the aquarium's important mission and just really really feel that so yeah reconnect with the mothership yeah yes what? yes what a, so you sort of shared some highs then, you know, the things that you really yes, like. Yes, yes. What would you like to share in terms of the things you don't enjoy so much or the struggle, yeah. with your struggle whatever, you know, however you want to term it? Yes. Um, gosh, that's really hard because I do love, I love what I do. Like I'm incredibly privileged to have had a job that I love for 15 years um, mm-hmm. and get to work with incredible people. So um, I, I think... You know, I, I, boy, it's really tough to think about. I mean, there's some some days where it, I, I think it feels like when you're trying to stay on top of everything because there is so much happening with with the program, and you know, we're planning this big summit at the end of September, um, and just making sure that all the ducks are in a row and everything's running smoothly. And but I, I'm again, I'm so fortunate with the team I have, and the aquarium has such a, a robust support system. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the things I think earlier in my career, it was harder because I was the sole, initially the sole person on the team. And I was the first person to run, run the program before that. It was like a, a part of somebody's job because it was really primarily just administering grants. And so that was challenging because I, I couldn't always figure out where to put my attention because there were so many different directions to go. And I was really trying to build the program. And, um, and so that I found, I found hard. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, fundraising is, it's not, I do enjoy it because I really love working with people who are interested in supporting our work. It's just, it's, you know, it's so critical. So sometimes that can be be stressful. It's, it's critical to the, the, the long-term success of the program. So I think there's, if we talk about what, what maybe keeps me up at night or gives me that, that's probably it just, you know, but again, I'm supported by a great team. So I'm lucky in that regard. Yeah. Well, that sounds wonderful. Um, what, when you look back at your career, obviously you've been within MCAF now in various roles going back, what did you do prior to MCAF and the Aquarium? What have been the, the key steps you've taken in your career that have helped to get you where you are? Well, um, yes. Yeah, so it was a bit of a, a circuitous journey, <laughs> that I, but I always, never, yes, but never one without a goal. Like I, I always, ever since I, I went on my first whale watch at thirteen, I always wanted to be a marine biologist, and and um, you know, uh, initially when graduating from high school, I didn't have. I I just felt like it was, I wasn't sure I'd be able to get a job in the field. I was, I was scared. Like, am I going to be able to find my place if I study marine biology and and I'm not a hardcore scientist and, you know, and so um, I, I looked around for other ways that I could engage in, in the field. Um, and in my senior year, I did a uh, um, honors thesis project on women in the environmental movement from like the fifties and sixties before in the United States, before it was really much of a, a strong movement. And so many of them said that working with kids was what they found to be the most impactful thing that they've done. And I, and I actually hear that from the project leaders and fellows that we work with today, like they feel like that's really where the the lasting impact is, you know? Um, and so I have teachers in my family and who love the profession. And so I ended up going into to teaching, um, to teaching earth and space science. And cause there was a real need for earth and space science teachers. And, and I did that for five years and I loved it. It was an incredible job, but I will say it is one of the hardest jobs. On the planet. It's such a hard job. I taught ninth graders and they were fantastic and funny and I love them. And, but wow, teaching is, is, is incredibly demanding, you know, in so many ways and emotionally, um, all those, all those different ways. And I think it's becoming more and more demanding by the minute. 
So um, I did have this chance to go to grad school and pursue what had been my dream of being a marine biologist. And so I went to the University of Maine and they had this new program at the time on um, a dual degree program and for a master's in marine biology and marine policy, which was a perfect program for me. So I got to study invasive crab, not whales, but, um, you know, invasive crabs on the coast of Maine and spend my summers just lifting rocks and counting crabs. And um, it was incredible. And I felt really fortunate to be able to do that. And then from there, I was able to get an internship working with the state of Maine in their coastal zone management program. And, um, and then, th- and then was um, able to apply for this job through actually a professor I met when I was a teacher who was working at the aquarium and said, you know, I think you'd be a great fit for this and asked me to apply. So, um, so yeah, so it was a bit circuitous, but um, so happy with where I ended up. And I, and I will say, I didn't, this, I did not plan on becoming a, you know, uh, working in philanthropy um, with, with my degree. I really wasn't sure. I knew it was a people person, which is a big piece of what this job is. Um, But it's ended up just being like the perfect job for me. And I've really, grown it as a, as had the ability to grow it um throughout my career here so so yeah so a bit of bit of twists and turns but it's always yeah. been my first love for sure you've landed in a place for sure you can sort of see the venn diagram of sort of marine yes, yes. education yes. policy yes. you know it, it it absolutely kind of fits quite a lot of aspects of what you're doing now it felt yes. squiggly at the time i'm sure but actually looking yes. back it's all built to where you currently are yeah completely and and being a teacher is is such incredible experience. And it gave me really good, um, you know, confidence with public speaking, as well as the, the best thing was, was being super comfortable with not knowing things because you can't stand in front of a bunch of teenagers and uh, pretend, you know, something you don't know, you have to like, you know, so, you know, it, it really enabled me to um, ask for help when I need it, say when I don't understand something or know something um, and, you know, really listen as well so so it was incredible um training for yeah, for what yeah. i do now yeah and as a parent i think you are too yeah. like you know during <laughs> covid we all did a bit of teaching and yes 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 full respect for teachers <laughs> i know no like i said there's this the uh, it's incredibly challenging and and one of the most important jobs there is and also one of the most challenging so yes all my all my appreciation to to teachers yeah me too yeah mm-hmm. um so thinking about um, a lot of listeners to us, we have professional conservationists, but we also have as aspirational conservationists, the students, job seekers, career switchers, people awesome. who are looking to kind of secure that first job working towards it. Um, what advice would you give someone like that who wanted to work either in conservation or perhaps marine conservation more specifically? What do you think is the really solid careers advice that might help people or what has helped you? Wow, I think the thing that has helped me is, is, um, well, um, real curiosity and interest showing when you're, you know, like, for example, with my professors in grad school or otherwise just showing real interest, wanting to, to do more, um, and, um, as well as relationship building. I mean, I think that for me, that's something I most enjoy about my, my job. And so I know it's, it's, um, and, in, in life. And so I, I know that's not always easy for, for everybody. Not everybody has that, you know, um, but I do think it's a real key sort of to build, build your network over time, get to know more people um, mm. and, and, and make those connections um, that can, can help, you know, get you to the, to the next thing or help you learn about something else. Um, mm. Because I feel like everybody can teach us something, you know, there's, there's something to learn from everybody you encounter in this world. Um, it is a really challenging field and it can be challenging in terms of equity as well, because, you know, an easy thing to say is like, well, do an internship, you know, because that's a great way in the door, but you can only do an internship if, if it's not a paid internship, you can only do that if it's, if you have the, the, you know, the financial wherewithal, um, to, to do something like that. So I do think there needs to be system changes as well, in addition to, um, what you personally do and recognize that, that, that it's not, it's not you <laughs> necessarily. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, but I think just taking every opportunity you can. So if, if it, if it means doing some after hours volunteering or, or trying to look for the paid internships that are out there, 
Um, you know, I think that's, it's visiting websites like, you know, uh, like yours that offer such great resources for sure is such a, an important thing to be doing. And, um, there's also the global, um, community ocean community newsletter that comes out and it has job opportunities and sometimes internships and things like that. So just, um, doing that as well. And then I would also just say for people who are more advanced in their career to, um, to make sure you you do you know reach out to people who are or 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 make time for the people who are reaching out to you uh mm-hmm. to learn more so it goes the other way as well like and provide those provide those you know the mentorship the resources because because it's not just about the support you can provide but you also learn so much in return so yeah absolutely yeah. so sort of throw a rope behind you and help people yes exactly that, you know. exactly and and yeah. and your life will be broadened for it you know so yeah yeah and we believe that too and I think we're very lucky at conservation careers that the vast majority of people we've reached out to to speak to just like yourselves have been yes. really open and supportive yeah. and I think that's fairly typical within the sector and something to kind of just yeah. hold on to that we are a friendly open supportive yeah. bunch by a by and large you know so yeah don't don't be shy make friends yeah absolutely and and you know I, I'm so grateful to the people who helped me along the way, you know, giving me opportunities and, and um, yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't be here without them. So, yep. so yeah, so it's important that we all pay that forward, um, yep. you know, in, in our careers. And I agree. It is a very, is a very open and supportive community. Yeah. Great. Great advice. Um, as we start to sort of wrap things up then, and afterwards we're going to um, turn the mics off or turn the recording yeah. off at least. We've got a few people listening in our audience here today and they can ask questions of you. And I'm looking forward to that. But we tend to kind of close the podcast with some just quite open questions just to see how you think or what you care about. And um, I've got a few in front of me. I thought I'd, I'd, I thought I'd play with a new one today, actually, which is if you yeah. could see one species in one location, what Oof. would you be and where? Wow, this is a, this is tough. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> wow. It's like choosing um, your favorite kid, isn't it? You just it can't is. do it. But a, you it, have to do it, it I'm afraid. Is. <laughs> it is. It is. Um Boy, that's such a tough. I I think, um, gosh, I I do love albatross. Like if I could just be unobtrusive <laughs> and sit in, the, in any Pacific island, you know, oh. just sit and watch albatross soar uh, every day, like I would be a happy person. So yeah, they're just incredible, and their journey is incredible, and and the the physics that enables them to to fly to glide those long distances, and they're beautiful and you know and also facing a lot of threats so um so yeah I I I, there's so many to choose from I also love octopus so yeah I I couldn't give you one but that if I had to give you one that would probably be it yeah I'm with you on that I think albatrosses are just fantastic family birds yeah Yeah. they are yeah lucky to have seen a few but they are and and the the one thing that's unique about them that I love is that their wings are so long when they fold them in they actually fold forwards Oh well, yeah, really? like, they have like double jointed because otherwise they're oh just my gosh. so far. So <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah I it's love incredible. That. Um other questions. So one would be um so when we look across the planet, you know, conservationists are doing fantastic work as as you've just yeah. described too. But broadly speaking, we're losing we're losing the battle. You know, biodiversity is in yeah. decline, nature is in decline, however we want to kind of call it. What do you think conservationists need to do more of or be better at if we're going to kind of turn around some of the declines? Yes. And I think it's admittedly now that you, you know, bringing that up does make me think about one of the um, parts of my job that that is challenging, not in terms of the job itself, but because of that aspect of things, because it is so hard to see species declining and um and also not just through my own eyes but for the people that we've developed these strong relationships with and to see what they're struggling with and facing this day after day after day and um so yeah so i I, that's that's a big piece of conservation is there can be there can be that um sense of despair even um and you know we're fortunate that that people are out there doing this work and taking it on day after day, despite those, despite those challenges. Um, And so I think, 
you know, from our perspective, things to do better would be to support more local leaders in in the field, like to really shift. I, I, I feel like people doing the on the ground conservation in their countries need our support and they are the engine of ocean conservation. They're the ones who are making it happen. And so I'd like to see more, you know, support for um, support for them in every way possible, more uh, recognition. I want to see their faces more in places and, and uh, highlighting them more, um, more um, focus on local and indigenous knowledge, which we're seeing more of an emphasis on that, but as well as not just, you know, in, in terms of funding, but also in terms of setting global agendas and making sure that when these large global agendas are set, that you're talking to people who are, who are again, are the engines of ocean conservation and they're the ones doing the work. So because the work they're doing benefits all of us. And that's another thing that I think we need to be better about communicating is that wherever this is, whether it's a shark, you know, sanctuary in Costa Rica or um, saving manta rays in Peru or sea turtles in Indonesia, like the, the health of the ocean and the species in it benefits all of us. And we need to communicate that more, why it's important to support, um, support this, this type of work. Yeah. And on that hopeful, positive yes. note, yeah, yes. I think yes. it's a great point to be wrapping up. And you're right. I was going to ask, like, how do we remain optimistic and hopeful? Yes. You touched on that beautifully. So, yeah, so more um, localization of conservation yes. and better communication about how people can support. Yeah. Yes. yes. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Elizabeth, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you yes. so much. So we're going to turn Thank the recording so off a second and open up to our audience. If people want to find out more about your work and particularly yes. about the Marine Conservation Action Fund, um, where should we send them? Where should they go? Yes. So um, you can go to the aquarium's website and then MCAF has its own web page, which is just um, www.neaq.org backslash MCAF. Um, so that's a way to find out. And then if you are a, a leader in a lower middle income country doing an ocean conservation project that's community based and want to reach out, just send send an email. Um, you'll find my email address on there uh, and, and let us know what you're what you're interested in in pursuing. Fantastic. Great. Yes. Yeah, we'll provide a link to it in our notes. Great. Thank and if you. you Google you. Marine Conservation Action Fund, as yes, I did, we'll get there. Yes. We'll find you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll find it. Yes. Yeah. And thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick, for the work that you're doing with conservation careers. I've referred many people to your to your uh, website and uh, such an important such an important service you're offering um, to the community. So thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Thank you so much. Right. And on that lovely note, we'll we'll stop there. Thank you very much okay. again, Elizabeth. Love to chat. Thank you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. And also, please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. And we really enjoy reading them all. As you'll have heard, our podcasts are now recorded in front of a live audience who sit in and listen to the chat. And then after the mics are turned off, they get a chance to talk to the host, to share their thoughts, and also to ask questions. It's a really great format. If you'd like to be in the audience, all you need to do is join the Conservation Careers Academy. Now, in the Conservation Careers Academy, you'll get full access to the world's biggest conservation job board, listing over 15,000 jobs, volunteer, and internships across the globe each year. You'll also enjoy access to our amazing CC Pro private members community with regular events, networking and support. Plus you'll get full access to our growing library of career boosting resources, guides and templates. And best of all, it only costs a few dollars, euros or pounds per month to join the academy. Now to find out more, please visit conservation-careers.com forward slash academy or simply click the join button at the top of our website. See you on the inside.